Hello, and thank you for joining this Onc Live TV Peer Exchange. Today, we are going to be talking about metastatic kidney cancer. With availability of several approved targeted therapies for both first and second line management of advanced renal cell carcinoma, patients are living longer than ever. There are still unanswered questions, however, about the optimal way to sequence and combine the drugs that we have today, and more questions are arising as new and exciting therapies continue to emerge. In today's discussion, we'll reflect on the most recent information and how the new data relate to the way we practice. I'm Daniel Heng. I'm from the University of Calgary in Canada and chair of the Alberta uh, GU Tumor Group and a staff medical oncologist at the Tom Baker Cancer Center. Today, joining me are Dr. Carlos Barrios of the Department of Medicine at the PUC School of Medicine in Brazil, Dr. Paul Nathan, a consultant medical oncologist at Mount Vernon Cancer Center located in London, UK, specializing in the treatment of kidney cancer and melanoma. Dr. Suzanne Osanto, a professor at the Department of Oncology for Leiden University Medical Center in Leiden, Netherlands. And Dr. Nazar Tanir, professor and deputy chairman for the Department of Genitourinary Medical Oncology, Division of Cancer Medicine at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. Thank you to each of you for joining us today. Let's get started. Let's begin by considering initial therapy for metastatic renal cell carcinoma. Paul, let's start with you. What's the best time to start targeted therapy? I, I don't think there's one answer fits all to that question. So I think one has to consider the individual needs of the patient. I think obviously there are a group of patients who are symptomatic at presentation or who have disease that you know is going to threaten them in the short term. And, and for those patients, there's no doubt you'd want to treat them uh, immediately and start, start to, as fast as you can. With kidney cancer, however, there are a group of patients who have quite indolent disease. And in the UK, we do, uh, uh, for those patients, try to identify them, making a judgment on the pace of the disease and the location of the disease. And if somebody's got good performance status and small volume, indolent disease, we would often watch and wait those patients until there's significant progression of disease. And we know in our local series that we would often wait more than a year before starting treatment. That algorithm may be influenced by the emergence of new immunotherapies, but for the moment, that's how we do it. Okay. So how do you choose your upfront therapy then? Do you use prognostic or predictive factors at all? I think our greatest driver is that clinical assessment of patient need at presentation. Um, I, I think the reality is that uh, outside clinical trials in clinical practice, one tends to be less driven by the formality of prognostic uh, uh, um, scoring systems. Um, but we, we do tend to use the, uh, uh, the, um, uh, the MOTSA scoring systems uh, locally, but there are obviously others, and uh, I know that you have lots of experience with, with, with others. I mean, what, what, what do you use in your practice? I use the IMDC criteria, and that's composed of six factors. Two are clinical, a Karnofsky performance status of less than 80%, a diagnosis to treatment interval of less than one year, and four lab factors, uh, anemia, thrombocytosis, um, uh, neutrophilia, and hypercalcemia. So um, I think, you know, for poor prognosis patients, we can use temsorolimus, uh, but we can also use it for selecting, um, uh, for example, for selecting patients for observation as you talked about. Mm -hmm. So very favorable risk patients uh, with one or two lesions, they could probably be monitored for a little while or even do metastatectomy. Um, but now recently we're also using it for determining who has a good enough prognosis for a cytoreductive nephrectomy. So for cytoreductive nephrectomies, if you have four or more of those factors, maybe your prognosis is not good enough to actually benefit from a cytoreductive nephrectomy. So I think that's how we can sort of use um, uh, uh, the prognostic factors. So for example, example, if you have lots of prognostic factors, six of them, maybe you should start targeted therapy right away and not get a cytoreductive nephrectomy. Daniel, mm -hmm. uh, like uh, Paul was saying, uh, I'm very intrigued with this population of patients that have more indolent disease and they may not require therapy uh, uh, initially. Uh, with all your experience looking at all these prognostic factors, any clues from your perspective in terms of uh, where this patient population may lay uh, oligometastatic disease like you were mentioning mm -hmm. and patients with uh, good performance status, is there anything in your large da database that can help us in that direction? 
Yeah, I think it's more about gestalt feel. And so we know that the favorable risk patients, um, uh, they, you, you could potentially uh, benefit from observation. But there are some favorable risk patients that need targeted therapy as well. And there's some intermediate patients that you could observe as well. So it's not perfect. Um, but it, it's maybe important to stipulate that those patients, and I completely agree with you, that uh, the clinical course of the disease in kidney cancer can be extremely indolent with patients even having large uh, uh, lung metastases uh, that are stable over the years. Um, but I think that it's, it's important to stipulate that those are not the patients that were entered into clinical trials because the moment there's a clinical trial, all the doctors are tempted to include those patients into the clinical trial. So I think that's very important. The, the real world is different from, from patients in clinical trials. But I want to go back to the uh, question that Carlos asked you about who are the patients that you are comfortable following, mm -hmm. observing, uh, active surveillance, so to speak, without really having to initiate therapy quickly. In our experience, and this was published by our group as well as others, uh, patients with uh, metastasis the pancreas, pancreatic metastasis is, is a signature of indolent disease. And I think patients who have uh, oligometastasis, as Carlos suggested, low volume, uh, sub-centimeter pulmonary nodules, these are patients who are uh, not candidates for uh, trials anyway because they don't have measurable disease by the way we measure with using the arbitrary system of RESIST. Uh, but endocrine uh, metastasis, particularly thyroid and pancreas, these are signatures of indolent disease. So I think when I look at you know, the uh, catalog of all the agents and therapies we have available to treat our patients, and, and Suzanne summarized it very nicely, uh, a sort of overview of all the therapies from interleukin-2 to bevinterferon to the VGFR TKI, I think let's not forget that uh, uh, you know, observation, surveillance is important. In our experience from MD Anderson, our database, we had about 6% of patients that we observed them for many years. Mm -hmm. And these are patients who we, we talked about have the, the low volume metastasis. So when you look at who are you going to treat, when you initiate therapy, it's the tumor biology. If patients has, you know, poor risk or are symptomatic, these are patients who need to be treated. But also it's the host. So I think let's not forget, I think the host is important. Are we talking about a patient who is very elderly with comorbid illnesses, where initiating therapy, even if uh, it would be, uh, you know, appropriate for another patient, for that elderly person who has comorbid illnesses, it will not be appropriate. So I think looking always at uh, what is the life expectancy of the patient has to come into the equation. So tumor biology and the host are very important. That's a very good point because in the IMDC, the International MRCC Database Consortium, we see about 15% of patients actually aren't treated with targeted therapy until after one year. And so there are a lot of people uh, that, um, that, we, uh, that we choose to observe, but they're they're carefully selected, uh, carefully chosen. Let's go back.